Hi, I'm Sal Cagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University in North Carolina, former Merchant Mariner, and an instructor in maritime industry policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point. Uh, welcome to this special episode of What's Going On Off of Santa Barbara, I Like Ike Edition. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in now, this is an update on board the uh, or what's happening on board the vessel, motor vessel, President Eisenhower. Uh, President Eisenhower yesterday was outbound from Los Angeles uh, about 3 a.m. their time. Actually, it was yesterday morning uh, when they had a shipboard fire on uh, on the vessel. Uh, they reported fire in the vessel. They uh, lost propulsion in Saint Barbara, uh, the Santa Barbara Channel between the Channel Islands and the coast of California. Uh, vessel went adrift. Well, first noticed this because the vessel identified itself as not under command, meaning that they're basically at the whim of, of ocean currents and winds. Uh, they called out for assistance and assistance was dispatched. Uh, one of the reasons I do this series, just so you know, is to provide more detail and feedback than you get from the news or it's, you can get online finding this stuff. Uh, I think that we don't have a lot of visibility of what goes on in the ocean and marine transportation. And so one of the things I aim to do really is to highlight this. And one of the perks of doing this since I started this literally with a motor vessel ever given running aground the Suez is to really highlight the successes. And while this vessel suffers a engine room fire, gets disabled, uh, I want to talk about the successes today because I think one of the things that we don't do enough is give attribution to those who undertake a career at sea. And so let me give you the what's going on with the vessel right now. So this is the latest out of GCAP, and GCAP has been following this. They are the ones actually who I got the story from initially. Mike Schuller over there sent me a, warrant, uh, a notice about this, and, and this is their story about it. That is the President Eisenhower. She's one of, uh, uh, of six APL vessels. Uh, there are three others uh, that are part of this nine ship fleet. Uh, they are American flag vessels. They're not U.S. built. Uh, these vessels in particular, these specific vessels right here, are, were all Korean built. These were former Hanjin Marine vessels. Uh, but they uh, operate in a very unique, tr unique trade, which I'll talk about here uh, in a minute. Uh, the vessel was subject of just a few news reports. I tried to find uh, news reports on it and there wasn't a lot on there. Obviously, it didn't get a lot of attention for obvious reasons. Uh, that's our track line. Let's see if I can blow that up there a little bit for you and I'll show you a better track line here in a minute anyway. Uh, let's see if we can blow it up, there we go. That looks a little bit better there. So that's our track line right there coming out of Los Angeles. She just loaded in Los Angeles, underway, heading up here, right off here, she stopped to drop off her pilot and then proceeded underway at about 20 knots when all of a sudden she lost power. Lost power, and then because of wind and current started drifting toward the shore there, uh, El Capitan uh, Park is right there, Naples, uh, a variety of obviously very pristine water right there. And so she started drifting. Uh, she's in the deep water there, several hundred feet deep of water here. Uh, and so she could not anchor until she gets closer. And that's a problem with the southern coast of California is you really can't anchor to get close. Plus the bottom of the California, that area right there, it's rocky. There's also a lot of uh, pipelines and, and material there left over from the oil drilling platforms that are out there. So dropping an anchor in this area is really the last ditch you want to do. And when the vessel lost propulsion, she did a couple of things. Obviously, an engine room fire, and I talked about this in a previous video, is one of the most dangerous. Fires on board ships are just deadly. Uh, all mariners are trained as firefighters. They go through firefighter training. Uh, however, they don't fight fires on a consistent basis. They're not like local fire. They're not like, you know, paid firefighters. Uh, in many ways, they're kind of like volunteer firefighters. Uh, I'm a volunteer firefighter. We train a lot for it, but we don't get a chance to really do it too often unless the call comes in. But we do it probably much more frequently than a crew on a ship does. And more importantly, when a crew on a ship has to fight fire, they're fighting for their vessel. They're fighting to keep their vessel afloat. Uh, you know, when we fight a fire and we go to a house fire, I'm not worried about whether I'll have some place to sleep that night or what's going to basically, you know, do I have to worry about another incident? I'm worried about putting the fire out. These guys have to worry about, and women too, have to worry about uh, flooding. They have to worry about the fact that there's may not be assistance coming anytime soon. And they're really on their own in fighting this. Now we don't have the details yet from APL or their parent company, CMA, about what type of fire this was, what caused the fire. We don't know. Uh, I would ask them, and I have sent notes to them about this is, is, Hey, share this story. This is a great story. You should, this is the type of story that 
shipping companies should want to get out there. They really should. I understand that this looks bad. You had a, a fire in your engine room. Nobody got hurt. Vessel was saved. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail because I think there's a lot of players in here. So who are some of the players involved? Well, first off, Coast Guard. Coast Guard was alerted and dispatched almost immediately. Now, the U.S. Coast Guard, for those of you who don't know, is, is a unique service. They're not part of the Department of Defense. They're part of Department of Homeland Security. And they are a jack of all trade, 11 specific missions they have. Uh, the Coast Guard does for the Merchant Marine certification of licenses. So when I got my Merchant Marine license, it was through the Coast Guard that I went and took my tests and they would update my tests and I would have to go through them to uh, update my license from third mate to second mate and so on. You'd, you'd go to them for the testing. Uh, they are also a law enforcement agency. Uh, they they, they are, are unique in that they are a law enforcement agency. Unlike the Navy, Army, they actually can have police powers, and they do. It's one of the reasons why you'll see right now, for example, Coast Guard vessels in the Black Sea and in the South China Sea and the Persian Gulf is because they have this law enforcement capability. Uh, they're also rescue and firefighters. Uh, they do a little bit of everything. And it, what's, it's what makes the Coast Guard such a unique entity, in my opinion. I, I, it does not get the notoriety it deserves. It doesn't get the money it deserves. And the men, <coughs> excuse me, the men and women to make up the Coast Guard are absolutely essential. So you'll see right here that immediately upon the, the call out, they dispatched assets out there. Uh, a helicopter was sent out there and an 87 foot uh, uh, Coast Guard cutter, the black tip was sent out here. That's this thing right here. That's her. She's a Barracuda class uh, cutter, one of these 87 foot, you always tell by the first two numbers on a five digit numbers of a Coast Guard cutter, the first two numbers are its length, 87 foot, uh, these are the jack, all, you know, jack of all trade kind of, uh, of uh, cutters that the Coast Guard has, they have a whole variety of different sizes, these are the 87 footers. They've got the new 154 foot of, of fast response cutters. They're getting ready to build a whole new class of medium class cutters, but these are them. And while they could not tow the vessel, uh, very minimal support they can provide to a large vessel like President Eisenhower. The more important thing is they were there. And in case something happened, they, they would be there to get the crew off. If the crew had to abandon ship, there was another uh, vessel there, the Ryan T, which was an offshore supply vessel, was also on scene. Uh, to provide necessary aid as needed. And the Coast Guard is always key because the Coast Guard could coordinate rescue assets. They could coordinate getting assets out to the scene. Again, when we talk about President Eisenhower, and this is her right here, that's her in the, uh, coming out of Santa Barbara Channel right there. Uh, accident took place up here. She's now being towed and taken out this way. Let's see if we can pull up her past track. I'm not sure how far back it'll go. No, yeah, this is when she was adrift here. So she came out of Los Angeles, Long Beach. Go back over here. That's down here. Here's Long Beach. She came out this way, would stop right about where she's at now, drop the pilot off. She was proceeding on, broke down in the channel here, and then began the drift heading here toward the coast. And you see how close she came, uh, fairly close at the time. And again, there, 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 was, there was concern. I mean, concern that this vessel was going to basically uh, drift ashore. You see her going here. She's kind of arcing up right here. You've got your scale here, one mile. She's only a few miles off the coast right here before she comes ashore in the range of Buena Vista and, and Santa Barbara right here. Could be catastrophic. Could be catastrophic. Uh, again, the vessel had no propulsion that we know of. Not sure if she had any power at all. She could drop her anchor. Anchors are not controlled by any electricity on the vessel. You've seen movies where they drop anchors, they throw a switch on the, on the bridge and the anchor drops. That does not happen. That's not the way anchors work. If you ever see a switch that says anchor on a bridge, it's the anchor lights. It's, it's not the anchor. You know, one of the most egregious depictions of that is the movie Battleship, where the, the Battleship Missouri drops its anchor and, you know, does this, this kind of, you know, handbrake turn. That Not only does that not happen, by the way, can I be clear? Where she dropped her anchor, she would never get that anchor back because they were in too deep of water. That's the situation, by the way, President Eisenhower had over here. She's in too deep of water. She could drop that anchor, but all it would do is dangle there at the end if it doesn't come running out and, and fall into the ocean, anchor and chain and all. Most anchors and chains are actually aren't attached to the vessel. That, that's another myth that, that, that's happening. It's usually the last link is, is, is very, just, just kind of very loosely attached. Uh, it'll come ripping out under the weight. Uh, you would have to wait to anchor this vessel till you're really close in, less than a mile or so off the beach. And there's no margin of error there. If the anchor doesn't grab, if it doesn't hold, it's a rocky bottom, not sand, which is what you want. Uh, it's plus the anchor and chain that holds you. It's not just the anchor. Uh, it's not very clear that, that 
anchoring President Eisenhower would have been a very good solution. What you needed to do was get her out of there. And that's where we saw action take place. So out of Port Wyneme, which is over here, came this vessel, uh, Teresa Brusco. Uh, tugboat out of Port Wyneme. You can see her right here. I think she's in anchor. She's in her port right now. Let's see if we can pull this up right here. She should be in port right now. She's out of Port Wyneme, which is a port just north. Yep. This is it. It's uh, right there by the Naval Construction Base. Let me uh, zoom out here a little bit so you can see exactly where that is. She came racing out of there, uh, racing out of there into the Santa Barbara Channel and heading up there to grab her. She's not a huge tug. Uh, she's more of a harbor pushing tug. She's not a tug for, for deep water towing. You'll see there her size. She's not a tremendously big vessel, but, but this vessel and the tugboat crew should get all the accolades in the world because they got out there, got a line probably passed to them from President Eisenhower through the bow, and they were able to pull President Eisenhower back out into the channel and be there in the nick of time. I'm not saying they saved all the lives of everyone on board, but they were definitely crude crucial here. They prevented a potential hazard. They pre uh, prevented a potential loss of life. There could have been crew members lost. Anytime you have to evacuate a vessel, you're taking chances there. And so this vessel, Teresa Brusco, did a great job. Not enough attention given to it, in my opinion. She is the one that saves the Eisenhower right here. Her coming out there, getting that line on and pulling her off is absolutely essential. As a matter of fact, if we, if we pull this up here, let's see if we can... Uh, pull up her past track and see, there it is. Let's see if we can pull up her past track, see if we can get an image here of it. Yep, that's a that, that's a great image of her right here. So she headed out right here out of Port Wyneme, raced, green line is fast speed, raced right here, hooked on that line and then towed. Let's pull this out here a little bit. You'll see her pulling initially when she was pulling them out, we weren't sure where she was going at the time. I wasn't sure either. There was a question about whether she was gonna get towed to Oakland to finish her voyage, or they're going to tour back to Long Beach. The tow to Oakland would have been a long way, 300 miles, maybe a two, three knots. That's that's 100 hours. That's a, that's a long, long tow right there, especially if the vessel doesn't have power. But it looks like she was towing her out to get her out in the main channel, get her across the channel right here. They were able to get her back going, heading back into Los Angeles, Long Beach, and then they passed the tow over. You'll see all of a sudden she speeds up over here. That's after she dropped the tow. She actually will, will drop the tow here let President Eisenhower lo loose and a new vessel comes in and it's this vessel right here, the Shirley C. This is a Shirley C, a venerable tug, uh, 1970 built, uh, 51 years old this year. I had somebody comment about this today, the highlighting, wow, it's such an old tug. Why are we using such old tugs? Those vessels, that hull, can I be clear of a tugboat built in the 1970s has got a steel hull that, that is, is like a tank. It, it's like a battleship. It's absolutely amazing, the steel that was used back in the, the 70s to build tugboats. I mean, probably one of the toughest hulls ever built are, are these ships right here. And what typically happens is these vessels get completely rebuilt, redone, remanufactured, new engines put in it. I am not sure about the Shirley Sea. I don't know the background of this tug specifically. Uh, love to talk to guys who, who are in, and women who are operating these th this vessel. But she's a big, larger tow tractor, uh, tow tug. Uh, sometimes you call them tractor tugs. And one of the reasons you can see is she's got this big, huge working area back aft. Usually when you tow a vessel, you, you have a long line that's attached to a vessel. And believe it or not, unlike the movies, the, the tow line isn't out of the water. It actually goes into the water. You actually put a lot of the tow line in the water. That absorbs a lot of the shocks of the tow. It, 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 you have what's called cantonary between the tug and the vessel. And that cushions it and gives you a nice steady pull. You don't have to worry about swells and everything kicking back on the vessel. And so what you want is a big tug like this. And that's exactly what Shirley C did. She showed up out there and picked up that tow and she's currently doing the tow right now. Let's pull her up right here where she's at. See what she's doing right here. Pull her up. She's uh, had the tow. Yep, there she is coming in. There's, there's uh, Los Angeles Long Beach right there. There's Santa Cruz Island. And if we zoom in here, there's a couple other tugs with them too that are there. Uh, disregard this. So you see this right here. So you see Shirley C right here in the front, towing behind President Eisenhower. There are two other tugboats here. Here's Delta Billy, a smaller tug with them. And then another tug, the Elizabeth C, which is probably similar to Shirley C, obviously. Uh, actually, we see it with a different name right here. So we're not exactly sure what name she's operating under. But she, you see her very similar to this tug right here, to the Shirley C. 
uh, probably on standby just in case something happens, a backup in case you need it. And they're probably going to pull her over to the Anchorage in Los Angeles, Long Beach, make arrangements either to get her containers off and obviously get some repair work done on her. Not sure if she's going to have to go into a shipyard or if they'll be able to repair her at anchor. It depends on the severity of the damage caused by the fire. But again, just an absolute great job by all the tuggies involved in this. Uh, did a great job. They were able to get out there and save the day. Let me be clear about tugboats. Tugboats to large vessels are a saving grace lots of times. When you get into trouble with a big boat, what you need is a batch of small boats to do it. And that's the case you saw there. The uh, Teresa Brusco was small, but she did the job just enough to get the vessel away from the beach so that Shirley C can come in and take over. Tugboats are absolutely essential. And one of the big problems I would argue in a lot of areas that we've seen in recent maritime incidents is not sufficient infrastructure tugboats available. Ever given, got beached, there was not large enough salvage tugs in the Suez to move her. You had to bring in those big, large salvage tugs. I did a series of videos back last year, or actually two years ago. Now, I think it was in 2019 when the Bonham Richard in San Diego had its fire. And the fact that they were initially trying to fight that fire with very small harbor police boats. And what they failed to do was bring in the larger commercial tugs that have more firefighting equipment on it. And even more importantly, is the fact that the Port of San Diego does not have a large firefighting boat. Los Angeles, Long Beach does. San Diego does not. Neither does Norfolk. Two of the biggest Navy bases in the world do not have large firefighting boats should fires happen on board. And so I, I think this story right here, the saving of the President Eisenhower by the tugs is really great. The other story I want to give you is the context of what President Eisenhower is, how she fits in. Uh, I showed this chart. This is from uh, the Maritime Administration. This is something called the Maritime Security Program. I mentioned this in a previous video. I'll load up here in a second. And these are 60 vessels that are basically um, given a stipend from the US government. And they're given $5 million per ship per year. So a total of 300 million a year for 60 vessels. And what they do is they dedicate their dedicated vessels that can be used in time of emergency, but also during peacetime, like right now, to haul cargo for the US military. And they're made up of a variety of different ships. You'll see right here, there are 18 roll-on, roll-off ships. There are two tankers that undertake a transportation of oil and fuel for DOD, Department of Defense, and Department of State issues. These two tankers in particularly bring a lot of oil and gasoline and high, high, uh, uh, high octane aviation fuel, for example, in a place like Israel. Uh, there are 23 container ships. Uh, there is a series of geared container ships, 11 of them, I believe. Yep, 11 geared container ships, and then these heavy lift ships. And what these 60 ships do is, is a variety of things. And down here in the lower corner here, you can see the information right here. They provide square footage. They provide roll-on, roll-off capacity. The roll-on, roll-off ships are basically big car carriers, basically. They look like big parking decks. And But what they can use is uh, load tanks and equipment for the military. We've been using them consistently over the past year during an exercise called Defender 2020. The container ships are on uh, set routes I'll talk about in a second. Geared container ships have the uh, cranes on board to offload their containers in ports that may not have large cranes. Uh, that's really important in time of war and conflict or natural disaster when the, 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 the ports may be damaged and you have container ships, but you can't offload them off vessels because most container ships today don't have the gear. And then these heavy lift ships are designed to carry a lot of oversized cargo. And, and I'm gonna do a special on just the maritime security program and the fleet, because I think it's a really interesting fleet. Let me talk about President Eisenhower and APL. So this is the route the vessel was on. She's one of six ships, and I did a, a, a tweet about this where I showed the six ships and where they were at. So uh, President Eisenhower and one other ship, <coughs> excuse me, were loading in the US, heading across uh, westward. Two are in, the Far East loading, and two others are on the way back. And so this six ship program here, and, 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 and one of the things you'll see here, and I think I have it right here under our US flag fleet. Yep, there she is. These are the ships that are in the APL fleet. Uh, six of them are named for presidents, and the other three are APL vessels. Six are in this EX-1. All the president vessels are in that EX-1 program. I'll come back to that. Two are in this GSX program. 
One is in the JMX program. And then there's also a shared program with Maersk where there's spots on the 11 vessels. So the JMX program, just to come on down here, that's the APL Gulf Express. Very small container ship, has gear. It's used within the Persian Gulf to move cargo around. And one of the things that the US military, and this is the key essential thing here, is the role of the military here and having a dedicated US flagged, US crewed, US owned uh, program is you want to make sure that when we're putting cargo on board for the military and maybe uh, cargo with, with, with classified secret material on board, you want it to be sure it's on vessels that you know and have some sort of accountability to. So the JMX program, APL Gulf Express, operates within the Persian Gulf. She operates solely within the Persian Gulf, operating around in that area. The GSX are these two vessels, APL Guam and Saipan. They operate from Japan, Okinawa to Guam and Saipan. Again, one of the things that, that, that should stand out about a lot of these things is the role of the military. So JMX, this is out in the Persian Gulf, high US military presence. Out here in the Far East, uh, Western Pacific, between Guam and Saipan, absolutely essential. And if you go back up here to the, the program right here, I mean, you have major bases right here. Oakland used to be a huge ocean terminal for the United States before it closed. Uh, the largest ocean base on the, on the West Coast was out at Oakland. You have the uh, container, uh, excuse me, the uh, ammunition facility out at Sunny Point. You had a large container and uh, military ocean terminal in Oakland out there, Fort Mason long ago before, before it was consolidated or out there. So same thing here, you're loading a lot of, of equipment for the US government and military over, going to Yokohama, Japan, big US presence in Japan, US base at Yakuska, Air Force bases there, heads down to Naha, Okinawa, again, another important base, Busan, South Korea, another critically important base. And again, you have that local transport that moves cargo from Japan, Korea, and Okinawa to Guam and Saipan. All of these are essential for U.S. military. All of them are essential for U.S. military. There are many advocates who are against this program, want to get rid of U.S. flag vessels. It's too expensive. It's too, you know, American crews are too, uh, too expensive to pay. This program costs $300 million a year. What do we get for this? We get secured transportation on U.S. owned vessels with U.S. crew members, with U.S. flags to these key el elements. Uh, there's other operators that do the same thing. Maersk Lines, uh, Waterman uh, which, which is part of Central Gulf Lines and Secor. Uh, there is a, a Hophog Lloyd, which operates on this. And I'll do a video that, that shows each of these, but this is why this is so important. And one of the interesting things here is now with President Eisenhower out of this six ship rotation, it's gonna cause a disruption, cause a, a, a potential disruption in that trade. Already we know these ships are, are full to the gunnels with material going to and from. Uh, these are not large, ultra large container ships. If you look again, let's go to the size here of these vessels. The uh, uh, the presidents here, I think I got them right. Yep, here we are. So, you know, we're talking about 6,500, 7,800 uh, containers, not a massively huge vessels. You know, these are not the big, huge, massive, you know, ultra large container ships like Ever Given at, at 20,000 boxes. But they're really important because they handle enough trade, sufficient amount of trade there that, that they are able to go in and out of US ports. The other good thing about a, a ship like President Eisenhower, for example, when she comes into a port like Long Beach in Los Angeles or Oakland, since she's US flag, she should have the priority to go to berth in front of these other vessels that are lined up waiting to come in because they're not US flagged. Uh, that is a bit of an issue because the port and terminals there like to cater to the foreign flags. And that becomes a larger and larger issue. There was just a letter signed by the uh, uh, agriculture, uh, there was an agriculture council uh, that put together a letter to Secretary Buttigieg, uh, Secretary of Transportation, uh, basically complaining about the fact that a lot of these carriers are not going back to Asia. They're coming out of the United States from the West Coast, going back to Asia, not loading their exports, their grain. Instead, they're prioritizing empty containers over US exports. And that is because uh, they, they either want the U.S. exporters to pay more money over their, over their empty containers, or they want those empty containers because they can load them faster than having to unload U.S. exports and then get the containers back. And so this is all part of a very intricate element. And I think the, the case here of President Eisenhower and the fire really highlights this. So I hope this gives you a little bit more background on the President Eisenhower and the fire that took place on it. As I mentioned to you before, the ship right now is heading for Los Angeles, Long Beach, 
Let's see if we can find her where she's at. She is 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 heading there right now. Let's pull her up here on the map here. She should probably be in, I think, late tomorrow. It's, it's a slow tow. They're not moving very fast in there when they're scheduled to get in. But they should be in there fairly late tonight, early tomorrow, coming in. They don't have too much further to go. You can see the the traffic right there. There's Los Angeles, Long Beach, all those. And all those ships off there, that's the ships waiting to get into berth right there. Yeah, and here she is, four knots. So she's moving along uh, under tow. Uh, you'll see her status change to underway. Uh, not clear what APL is going to do at this point. Uh, again, uh, will they offload the vessel? Probably offload the vessel, get the cargo onto other vessels, go up to Oakland and in that route they have. Uh, not sure about the repairs, but we'll keep track of this and keep following it. If you enjoy this video and you like videos like this, and you want to learn more about the US, US maritime and world maritime industry, please click and subscribe. Uh, hit the bell so you'll be alerted for new videos when they come out and give it a thumbs up. This way we can get a little bit further boosting there by YouTube and maybe we can uh, hit some uh, people who don't know anything about maritime trade and ocean commerce. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, feel free to comment and I look forward to talking to you at the next episode. Hopefully it doesn't involve another disaster, but unfortunately <laughs> these, these tend to happen about weekly. I'll be talking about the uh, collision between the A-Symphony uh, tanker out in, in, in Sing Tao. Uh, probably in the next episode because there's more information about her. Thanks for tuning in.